So, good morning, Coalition. <clears throat> A little froggy. Good this morning. <clears throat> and uh, it's great to see everybody. And uh, we've got a wonderful interview. Stan Walters has agreed to join us as our interviewee this morning. So thank you for joining us, Stan. And um, as usual, if you all would just sign in and give us your place that you're working, we would appreciate that. We're going to uh, record this so that if people would like to join later to watch it, then they can do that. And I'm going to turn it over to Allison for a few seconds here to talk about what's going on with the coalition. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning and happy Friday. I hope you all had a great week. I just have a few updates this morning. Um, the first one is just a reminder that our next coalition meeting is August 20th. Um, please let me know if you need to um, if you need to receive that calendar invite again, and I'd be happy to resend that to you. Um, a member email went out yesterday with a few resources and events, um, just a few events that I would like to highlight. Um, the Carolina Center is hosting their virtual conference, um, so please see your member email email or visit their website to register for that. Um, Transitions Life Care has a fall caregiver summit, so please see your um, email for more information on that. And then the Coalition on Aging is having their annual meeting and luncheon, which is a hybrid model, in September on the 24th. Um, so again, visit their website for more information about that. And then the last update I have for you is um, Parvathy from the caregiving work group was a part of a webinar yesterday on a caregiving guide. Um, so please see your member email for more information on that and then access to that guide. Thank you, David, and welcome, Stan. Thank you very much. Thank Pleased you to be Allison. here with all these smiling faces. Yeah, that's great. So Stan, yeah. you were, you're a native Ca uh, North Carolinan and mm -hmm. uh, you you uh, you were born and raised in Durham, you told me. So tell me a little bit about uh, what what it was like growing up uh, as the middle child of three <laughs> brothers and what y'all did when you were growing up. Well, my uh, it was uh, it was it was an interesting time. And my older brother is six years older. My younger brother is five years younger, and. Uh, my older brother, of course, picked on me uh, uh, while, <laughs> while he was home until he went in the military. And uh, and then my younger brother started picking on me. He was a wrestler in high school, junior high and high school. So he started picking on me. But, uh, but anyway, managed, managed to make it through. It was, it was a great family. Uh, and uh, dad um, worked six days a week for Belt Leggett in downtown Durham when there was actually a downtown, uh, downtown Durham before. And mom was a graduate of the Watt School of Nursing in 1938, nursed for 44 years, mm. all graveyard shift. Don't know how and where they managed to do that and many other things. They were both active in the church and community civic organizations, as well as taking care of friends and neighbors in times of need. So caregiving was kind of ingrained in me and at least witnessing it over the years. And so that's why as, uh, I'm... That's that's my that's my thing as far as caregiving and patient advocacy, because mm -hmm. it's all been demonstrated. And, and by the way, um, uh, if I ever in a meeting look like I'm sleepy or not paying attention, I am paying attention, but I look sleepy because I've been diagnosed with the uh, Duke Sleep Clinic as being a major insomniac, and I blame it on my mom because mm -hmm. you know, for nine for the first nine months of my being. She worked graveyard shift. She carried me. She kept me up all night for for the first nine months uh, of my of my life, and it's uh, and I haven't been able to do otherwise since then, as far as staying awake at night versus sleeping in the day, whatever. So anyway, that's my excuse. Well, we've we've never seen you uh, looking at all sleepy, Stan. You look like you're awfully busy, and I'm sure you still are. So. I wear pink to match my eyes. And, uh, <laughs> there you go. Early in the morning. So, so you grew up in, in Durham and uh, you went to high school. I think you said you, you played football and you were in track and then you went off to college. Where'd you go? I graduated Durham High in 1964 and went to ECTC uh, at, at that particular time and uh, on a football scholarship. 
and uh, but uh, did 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 well academically and athletically. But uh, by the end of my freshman year, uh, I realized uh, I was troubled by the fact that I didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And basically, I still don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life, but it's taking care of itself here. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I I felt like I needed to take some time to make some career choices before continuing on with my education, so I could do it properly. So uh, so I went into the military, and uh, was a uh, was joined joined the Navy and. Uh, for four years and I was a aviation electronics specialist uh, for jet aircraft electronics and uh, after returning back to Durham and back to ECU got my business administration degree and interviewed with Texas Instruments who actually built a lot of the equipment that I worked on in the military and they readily said yay verily come on and go to work for us and uh, and I was a, for them, a manufacturing engineer and manager uh, doing research and development and, uh, and uh, manufacturing of uh, missile guidance systems for the military. Very, very interesting to say the least. So, so let me stop you for a second. Yeah. First of all, uh, was your draft number low? No, not really. Oh, okay. uh, all right. I just wasn't just, just checking on that. But but thank you for your service. Uh, Stan and I both spent time in the Navy, so we were able to share a little bit about that and how he was working on A7 Corsairs and and was on a uh, aircraft carrier out in in uh, the uh, Tonkin Gulf, South Pacific, and the Tonkin Gulf, and uh, in, involved with that, but. Uh, Anyway, so you, you moved from Durham uh, or actually uh, Jacksonville, or excuse me, not Jacksonville, Greenville, Greenville to uh, uh, after, after you joined the Navy, then you moved to Texas and you were in, in, uh, in Texas for a good while. Dallas, Fort Worth area for a, for a while. Great place to be, just good, good can-do attitude out there, thoroughly enjoyed it, but after a while I got tired of the four battleship gray walls that I was working within in the secret facility and uh, decided I needed to get out a little bit more and ultimately went to work for the uh, for United's, um, well, for a uh, surgical instrument company, United States Surgical Corporation, mm. and which uh, at that time was growing and cutting edge, new types <laughs> of surgery. <laughs> is, that, is that a pun? Was that it was kind of funny, wasn't it? There <laughs> didn't mean for it to be, but I'll use that from now on. And uh, but uh, new, new state of the art equipment and uh, market marketing that and sales and training, uh, actually mostly training surgeons and uh, technicians and nurses in the use of the instruments. And I went through extensive training at the United States Surgical Facilities and uh, learning about surgical procedures and protocol, anatomy, physiology, and such as that. Uh, so I could actually, I was actually qualified to scrub in with uh, the surgeons and nurses and such and their oh. initial uses of the instruments to make sure everything is working properly. It's, you know, we're, we're talking about cesarean sections, uh, instruments for new cesarean sections, heart bypasses, bowel resection, reanastomosis, just about everything. And it was uh, it was really exciting and really, really interesting. Is so, that where you met Dr. Dr. Sweeney? I'm sorry? Did you, meet, did you meet Dr. Sweeney when she was uh, OBGYN? <laughs> no, I didn't meet her, but we had a lot of talk. And I had a lot to talk about uh, since then in, in, in her career. And uh, and spending time with her. Hey, Charlotte. She's here. <laughs> yeah, she is. I love it. <laughs> That's great. But well, having spent a lot of time with her in our patient advisory councils and and such over the years, so so it's, that's great. She's an exciting person. Mm -hmm. So, um, what what was that like shifting from missile guidance systems to uh, U.S. surgical and being able to scrub in with surgeons and 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 work in in the uh, OR? Well, you know, 
Uh, it, sound, it sounds crazy, but, uh, but in a way it was a fairly easy transition because as far as electronics and putting things together, developing new systems and such as that, is very, very technical. And I was able to take that technical ability and change it over to uh, not on electronic systems, but personal and, and anatomical systems. Let's, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Connecting blood vessels, connecting all different parts of the body and such as that. So it was easy. And, and also uh, as, as, a, as a kid and for many years, um, did a lot of fishing and hunting and uh, was, was, pretty, was pretty good at uh, excising things, uh, cleaning fish and such as that. And so I was kind of used to, <laughs> used to seeing a lot of the anatomy, so it didn't bother me a whole lot then. <laughs> well, that's good, that's good. So, so tell us how you, you got from there to being a caregiver and a patient advocate and, and working in that, that world. Well, in, uh, in, in, 19, in 1990, I finally uh, had an epiphany that for many reasons, North Carolina was the place I needed to be. It was one of the best places in the country to live for a lot of different reasons, including uh, being here with great people like you. And uh, that, that was one thing. And also, my mom was beginning to have uh, medical problems and needed assistance. Hmm. So I moved back to Durham and became a realtor, which allowed me flexibility to take care of mom. Really? Okay. And uh, so I was, uh, as, as a lot of as a lot of us are, a lot of uh, the rest of you have experienced. Uh, I was more or less alone in my uh, endeavors to take care of mom. My brothers lived in Alabama and Ohio, respectively, and they could have helped if they. Would, they would have helped if they could have, but families and jobs didn't allow them uh, to be here. Um, and dad uh, had died uh, years previously hmm. uh, from a heart attack due to coronary artery disease, which I found that I had apparently inherited. Hmm. In 2012, I came within 5% of total blockage of my LAD, AKA Widowmaker. Yeah. And uh, but with uh, angioplasty and a stent and some regular medication, I've been doing well ever since then. Well, we're glad for that. But um, but I mentioned mom's 44 years of bedside nursing. She absolutely loved hands-on care, but I think that kind of uh, ultimately uh, affected her and uh, her later life and that uh, bad knees, bad hips, bad shoulders uh, from all the lifting that she had done for many years. Mm -hmm. And she ultimately had both shoulders replaced, one knee replaced, one broken hip replaced, carpal wow. tunnel surgery on both hands, emergency hernia surgery, TIAs, multiple myeloma, congestive heart failure, and calcinosis. And calcinosis, as, as y'all probably already know, is uh, the result of an excessive amount of calcium in the body, not necessarily related to consumption. And it manifests itself in mom in her lower legs. And uh, they, were, it, it was, they were uh, collected in numerous deposits in her lower legs. And from the size of a VB to as large as a grape. Mm. And they were too numerous to be surgically removed. So they were left to eventually work their way to the surface. They were irregular shaped. You've seen, you've seen pictures and depictions of uh, asteroids. Well, these were like miniature asteroids, sharp, irregular edges, hmm. that eventually worked their way to the surface, creating open wounds that if not immediately and constantly cared for, could become infected and, and possibly become septic, uh, possibly become septic. So, Wrapping constantly and taking care of that in itself uh, was uh, was a real uh, challenge. And uh, with numerous uh, visits to the Duke Wound Clinic, we were ultimately told that, that you couldn't stop it. They were going to keep on coming. And, and eventually, it would likely become infected and cause sepsis. And the only alternative was amputation of her legs, lower legs. 
which is in her 80, late 80s and early, early 90s. She's and then being a still being a nurse in mind, wanted to take care of everybody else and was still partially active in her daily life in mind. Uh, it was not it was not an option for her and and, I know and, that mindset. And, and exactly. And and again, thank you, Catherine, thank you for your service. Uh, but uh, but ultimately, uh, ultimately, that's that's what uh, that's what took her. She was in a nursing home, and when she passed, and interestingly, yesterday, yesterday was the thirteenth anniversary of her passing. Mm, wow! Wow! So, so, so you found yourself with a new focus on caregiving and patient engagement. And, uh, and so how did that transition stand? And, and thank you for taking care of your mom that way. I mean, that Almost was 20 years, if my math is correct. That was significant. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty close to it. Pretty close to it. Exactly. And uh, well, I'm, I'll, just, I'll just say uh, all of that with the wheelchairs, bathing, feeding, emptying toilets, treating, wrapping wounds, medications, whatever. I was so glad to have been able to do it and I wouldn't change a thing except hopefully find out uh, a, a better way of doing things. But, uh, you know, after all, she walked my butt and cared for me for many years. So it's the least, so it's the least I could do. Uh, but uh, that, uh, after she passed, I got to thinking about all the wonderful care that she had received over the years. And, uh, but also got to thinking about times more than a few times that I saw things that could have been bet, done better for for better outcomes and better treatment, and uh, and I wondered what could I do to make a difference, and especially sitting in waiting rooms, oftentimes with other patients, family members who were confused about what was going on, really didn't know what's going on as far as their uh, loved ones' cares, and were being ignored. So what could I do to make a difference, and also to make uh, for patients and family members and also for the nurses. That was one of my, that was one of my big things too. If I could make things easier for everybody and especially the nurses, if the nurses had a better, had, had it easier then the patients would, uh, could get uh, better, better care. And I say that because not only was my mom a nurse, but my wife is a nurse. Our daughter's a nurse. My <laughs> wife's twin sister is a nurse. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so I hear the frustrations and the celebrations, uh, all within HIPAA guidelines, of course. Mm. And uh, <laughs> you didn't know there was a nursing gene, and you passed it on. <laughs> uh, so, so that uh, so ultimately, I found out about the uh, I found out about the Duke University Health System Patient Advocacy Council, which was uh, begun in 2004. The uh, former Chancellor of Health Affairs had realized that hmm. uh, if patients had equal say so in decision making in their healthcare process, then they recovered quicker and had fewer readmissions. So he developed the Patient Advisory Council, which was made up of a diverse community of former patients and family members uh, to uh, improve communications uh, between patients, family members, administration, staff, and such, and made, made a difference, made a big difference uh, over the years. And that will, not only I would say so, but a lot of other people would say so because it's continuing on and eventually morphed into, and I was, I'll say I was, I was chair and senior chair of, of the group uh, at one time and it uh, eventually morphed into dividing into uh, departmental and service line patient advisory councils so people could kind of pick and choose what excited them and what they really wanted to concentrate on as far as developing a better patient advisory council in different areas. So, uh, so eventually uh, I was uh, on the emergency services, patient advisory council, um, primary care, uh, Duke uh, Regional Hospital, patient advisory council. And, uh, and I think uh, I was at primary care with you, wasn't I, wasn't I Charlotte? Weren't we together on that? 
and, uh, and eventually also with the uh, Veterans Administration with a uh, Veterans Research uh, Development Organization there that uh, Charlotte also introduced me to. Uh, also had an opportunity to uh, speak uh, as again Charlotte did. We we're a part of a speakers bureau which uh, talked to different departments as well as in, within the institution uh, as well as in public, letting people know about patient uh, advocacy and uh, better patient care. And we were part of the North Carolina Healthcare Association uh, as, as volunteers for several years in uh, talking to other groups and other uh, hospitals and institutions and their groups across the state of North Carolina, which was very exciting. So Stan, you, you never take anything on and do it just a little bit. You, you go into it and you, you go whole hog. I mean, you know, you're just really after it. So here's, here's a question from Sue Collier. She says, as a caregiver, what would you like to see done in North Carolina to support other caregivers of patients with serious illness? What, what kinds of things could, could we be doing that we're not doing right now? Well, some type of some type of information format, um, and I, and I know I know we've touched on a lot of things in our, in our coalition and the different groups in our coalition, and I just wish we could morph them all together and then combine them and direct them into uh, into a information bank that maybe had one or two. Uh, places to go to for people who can and will use the computer or any other devices to go to these information information banks and pick out uh, things that interest them that they need help with to be able to go to to find information and and support. Uh, that's just uh, one of the things. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, just yesterday also the wife of a, a long life, a long time friend of mine who has developed uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, she called me and said, Stan, I'm having a terrible time trying to find information about where I might be able to place Bob for, for continuing care. So, uh, so, so things, things like that, it needs, needs to be developed and developed quickly. I, I think that's that's very uh, well said, and and I think that's a uh, an area that certainly our our caregiver and, and patient engagement working group can can focus on. Uh, I hope you're listening, Karen. Um, but uh, you know th there are a whole lot of things that are related to that that I think we we could focus on as we move forward. So, so Stan, I have a question. Um, one of the things I saw often was that every new family that starts with a serious illness or a, a, a long-term diagnosis has to do is they have to get their sea legs. They have to begin to make that psychological adjustment to this is going to be a long, a long haul, a long adventure, if you will. How can we get how what can we do to help get information to people earlier so that they don't have to find it all themselves because one of the things i see over and over again is everybody starts exploring and it takes some different amounts of time to get to the point where they feel like they know where some of the resources around them are and some of the support is you know that that again is something that uh that has come to light quite a bit. Uh, I was uh, I was deacon in a church for, for quite a few years and uh, we each had uh, families that we cared for and an aging population in the church. I got involved with several families over the years that had uh, uh, Alzheimer's, a member of the family had Alzheimer's. And uh, a lot of people don't understand Alzheimer's and know what's going to happen. And they think I can take care of my family member. It's easy to do right now, but it turns out to be turns out to be such a such a terrible situation. It's such so frustrating and so time uh, 
Well, anyway, y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, so you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head right there. Why, why not have, uh, have, if they can do 15 second or 30 second uh, TV bits concerning the lottery, the education lottery uh, on a regular basis, things like that, then why can't North Carolina do something about, uh, again, getting on TV and saying, this is what you need to do. This is what you can do. These are the resources that we have. And, uh, and uh, maybe, maybe let people know early on and not just when, not just when it's already happening, but also um, maybe starting, maybe starting out educating people uh, when they're in their when they're in their teens, because a serious illness doesn't uh, doesn't happen later in life, oftentimes to their parents. A lot of times it happens when they're in their in their teens and in early twenties, for goodness sakes, uh, serious illness happens. So they need to understand. Uh, the situation to how to become better educated and prepare, convince convince their parents uh, to do the living wills and the paperwork and the legalities that they need to do to take care of themselves later on down the road before before things happen. Yep, yep, Be that's prepared. very very important. So John Toma has a question. Uh, he, he's he's asking. Uh, what advice do you have, and this will need to be our last one because we're getting close to the top of the hour, but what advice do you have for a small healthcare provider? I don't know how small transitions is, it's, it's pretty big, but anyway, to form and build a patient and family advisory council. Uh, as to whether I would recommend it, well, well of course, apparently, apparently there's consideration there with, that, uh, uh, with John's question. Um, but, uh, advice would be to, well, you can, you can talk to me or, or to, or to Charlotte, uh, for instance, and, uh, for us, us together to kind of get some ideas about how to form it and to not be, to not be shy about inviting former patients and family members, uh, into, uh, into the organization or into an interview and, and develop. Uh, develop a program, uh, and and all in all, it's, it it takes it takes time and tenacity, and it takes it takes buying in from the the heads of the organization there from upper level management, but but it but it can be done because it's worth it. It works. John, any any follow up? No, thank you, Stan. I definitely uh, follow you up on your offer and I saw that um, also Sue Collier offered um, to provide some guidance as well so thank you Sue. Oh yes absolutely she, um, I think so you know what she's talking about there and I'm sorry I left her out and Charlotte I apologize for volunteering you without your giving a thumbs up. <laughs> 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 well, we, we've got so many folks here, and, you know, Heather and Mary and, and certainly Charlotte and, and Sue and, and many folks that have uh, been engaged in patient engagement and, and uh, caregiving. And obviously, and obviously numbers of people in our coalition that are favoring patient advocacy. And that's why, that's why everybody's here. To, to make it to make it better and thank thank you everybody for what you do and thank you stan for sharing your story with us this morning it's great to learn more about you and about what you've been doing and man you've had an exciting life it's been interesting and it's been it's been great and to and to to highlight things thank you for letting me be a part of this organization as well this this is a highlight there's no doubt about it thank you well we appreciate it, and uh, we hope everybody has a great weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Take care.